Hello, everybody. Welcome to yet another session of Young Science Leader Series presented by Young Academy of India. I'm Dr. Felix. So here with us, Dr. Roxy Matthew Kaur. Uh, we have been waiting to hear from you, Roxy. Uh, Roxy is climate scientist at Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, IITM, one of the prestigious institute under Ministry of Earth Sciences in, in, uh, in Pune. You know, he's uh, based in the uh, in Pune and, uh, uh, you know, while chit chat, I came to know that this institute is really old, 60 years old, uh, very, very famous. It has got some supercomputer. I'm waiting to hear uh, the supercomputers as well of this particular institute. He's a leading, uh, he's leading a research on uh, the climate change and impacts on Indian Ocean and the subcontinent, particularly the monsoon, cyclones and marine ecosystem. You see, it's now it's a really a current hot topic because cyclone is already uh, underway. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a it's a current affairs topic. So we are waiting to hear a little bit about that as for now. And he's a chair of very prestigious a panel that is called Indian Ocean Regional Panel by United Nations. And also he is a member of this IPCC, that is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, it's a UN organization, you see. Uh, he's also a lead author of this IPCC. And uh, I've been following Roxy for quite some time. And he has been attending all these IPCC meetings, you know, several countries, several parts of the world. Now I think it has gone online because of the COVID-19. And um, most importantly, he has been featured among the top two percentage of the scientists all over the world. Uh, it's a ranking released by the Stanford University. You know, he's one of the uh, top two percentage. Uh, that is amazing, Roxy. Great achievement. And uh, just to share uh, with all of you, Roxy, uh, I know him very long time, uh, you know, uh, uh, way back in NIO, isn't it, Roxy? I met you first time in uh, NIO Goa. And then we did PhD together, I mean, different university. Roxy was in uh, Hokkaido. And I met you there, Hokkaido, I remember that. And yeah. you gave me a very nice book of Salman Rushdie, you know, and the Jibril is the uh, protagonist of the book. I still have that book with me. Oh, you, did you forget that? I will not forget it. It's a great book. And uh, yes, so I'm really happy to have you with us, uh, Roxy. And along with me, we have a co-moderator of this session and uh, co-moderator, she has moderated earlier also, one of the earlier session, it's uh, Miss Naomika. Over to you, Naomika. Naomika is a BE, second year student at Anna University. I guess you're doing geoinformatics. Am I right, Naomika? Over yes. to you. Good evening. I'm Naomika and I'm studying at Nana University, BE Geoinformatics. And I'm really eager to hear from Dr. Roxy because uh, it's related to my field, climate studies. And I invite Dr. Roxy to go on with this. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, thanks for a very beautiful <laughs> introduction, Felix. And uh, Naomika also for both of you for hosting this uh, talk here. I am I'm very happy that uh, we are having this kind of discussion, much of a candid kind of discussion with uh, scientists, researchers, and uh, also for the for the Young Academy of India. And uh, this is something uh, which is quite important and can you know I, I I very often go out and give talks, but that is very scientifically oriented, very narrow in in that particular field that I work on. And, uh, but it doesn't give insights to other researchers uh, in similar fields on how, how to go about with science or how do a scientist take their journey. I think that is what uh, uh, Felix was, Felix and uh, the audience is looking forward to, right? So very, very happy to be here. And uh, I am actually talking from my office uh, in Pune. Uh, like Felix told, uh, uh, we are facing the cyclone. Actually, in fact, the cyclone started south of uh, East Arabian Sea near Kerala coast, where my hometown is, and then it moved north towards Goa. I heard last night it had a severe impact on Goa. And now it's along the Maharashtra coast, and in Pune, we are facing occasional winds. You can you can see the the, the mango trees slightly moving now. Yeah. You can yeah. see that yes so, so the winds are there occasionally uh, some of some, sometimes uh, it becomes strong so see it has got a very interesting funny name isn't it? i don't know how to pronounce it toktai toktai ah, you pronounce it tote tote, tote. So, uh, so one interesting thing is that the cyclones are named 
by different agencies from around the Indian Ocean. And uh, so every year they give a list of names. So this uh, list is already made. So when the next cyclone comes, you already know which uh, uh, name we are going to pick. And Tote, the name comes from Myanmar, agencies in Myanmar. And it means gecko or lizard in Myanmarese language. Yeah. OK. OK. Uh, I would like to invite Nomika. Do you have any questions to Roxy? Yes, sir. So what is your story like? What about your childhood, your family, your parents and all? Yeah, wonderful. Uh, actually, I had a very active uh, childhood uh, with, uh, I, I'll take you through my journey. So let me share my screen. I have, I have prepared some uh, slides for you guys. So let me see if uh, I can share them with you. Can you see it on full screen? Perfect. Go ahead, please. OK, so well, this picture shows on uh, I mean, this this is a picture of journey. Sometimes it is independent individual journey. Sometimes you need to leap into the darkness, take that risk. Right. So this this picture often adorns my wallpaper on computer screens on my working screen usually. And uh, it, it talks about taking risks in life, risks in science. But it's not just taking risk. It's not just taking absurd risk. Uh, you see this this boy over there. Let me see if I can use a lesser pointer. Yeah. So the boy is holding a light, a lamp over here. So that can be anything. It can be information. It can be books in your life. It can be the parents in your life. It can be Google while you're searching. So there is always information that lamp that you can carry with while taking your risk or while you're taking uh, leaping into darkness, uh, uh, whether it is research or science or whatever it is. So I, we will come back to this, but this is uh, uh, the journey that I wanted to present to you. So I'm, I'm starting as, as when I was a child. Uh, I'm sure you can spot me here. Uh, I'm over here. And this was like how many years back? Some 40, 42 years back, right? And uh, I'm sitting in a village in Africa. So I was born in Nigeria. My parents were teachers there. This is my dad. Uh, he is wearing something like a lunky or uh, I don't know, some uh, or some uh, patent pants. I don't know. He's stylish, right? Uh, and so they both were teachers. My dad was an English teacher there over there in uh, Africa in Nigeria. My mom was a physics teacher over there. I was born born in Africa, and you can see all these beer bottles there. Well, I love, I still love beer, so maybe there is some affinity that I got from here, right? <laughs> and you can see a lot of uh, Africans around uh, uh, who had helped us throughout. And there is an African saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, and this might be true for me, and this might be true for everyone over there. I remember that some of uh, I have only faint memories of my childhood over there. I, I lived there until I was four years old. Uh, and uh, I remember that uh, daily when they when they used to go, go for school, I other, uh, sometimes I used to accompany them to school or otherwise uh, some of the neighbors or kids, other older kids used to take care of me. So, uh, but uh, later we wanted to, I mean, so this was a risk that my parents took uh, going into Africa and on land and uh, they had a good time there. I think I also had a good time there. My, I had a brother later, we also had a good time. And uh, late, but later after a few years of working there, uh, they also worked uh, under, I, I think the schools there were funded under the UN. So uh, before that they traveled uh, to other countries in Africa as well, Kenya and all. So, but then we all came to India, my, uh, uh, my homeland in Kerala. So Kerala is in south, south of uh, India, uh, to be exact, somewhere in Kotten. So uh, the person whom you see here, I don't know if you can spot me here, one among this, actually this is me. So that is Roxy for you. And this is my brother, Georgie. And carrying him is uh, my grandmother, my mom's mom. So I used to live in this place with my grandmom for 
uh, it was a huge joint family. I used to live with, with them for a few years before uh, we, we moved on to our own house. So you can see me <laughs> a bit uh, uh, not so happy. Probably uh, it's because uh, my, bro my brother took my grandmother's lap or maybe he was brawling and I didn't like it. I don't know. I don't remember at all. <laughs> but you can see a jealous me or uh, somebody a moody me at that time. Anyway, that was me uh, while I was growing up, uh, like any other child. And then I went to school in Kerala, went to college in Kerala. Uh, so during my undergrads, I took uh, physics, uh, degree in physics in CMS College. Uh, that's the college in Kotem. You know, that's the that's said to be the first college in uh, India, all over India. It was established by the British uh, in around 1817, much before uh, the Madras University was formed and later it was affiliated with the Madras University. So I, I, I studied uh, physics uh, in this college and then I took up uh, physical oceanography, ocean physics. So you will see uh, later why I was interested in oceans and all uh, in another slide. So I had this affinity to nature and all, and uh, that is one of the reasons why I took up oceans. And probably the fact that my mom was a physics uh, teacher also, you know, there was some inclination towards science and physics and all. So this is a picture of me in Goa when I uh, started off my early research period. Uh, that was after my master's in Cochin University. So I did my master's in ocean physics or physical oceanography in Cochin University. Uh, anyone, if, if someone is interested in ocean sciences or climate sciences, Cochin University presents you a wide variety of marine science courses over there. And then I went to National Institute of Oceanography in Goa, where I did a research work as a CSA research fellow for one year. And that's a picture you can see in a uh, me in a ship. This is one of uh, prestigious ships of India research vessels. It's called Sagar Kanya, uh, the, the ocean uh, mermaid, you can see. <laughs> and uh, this is a measuring, uh, the ocean measuring instrument that is in my hand, which we uh, dip into the ocean. So these were growing up years. I learned about uh, the science around. And then I moved on to Japan. So this is where Felix, our host, also did uh, his uh, PhD in another university in Japan. So you can see the map of Japan here, right? And we were, uh, I was in the northernmost island. You know that Japan is made of four islands. You have the uh, Honshu, uh, Kyushu, and other islands. And you have the northernmost island, Hokkaido. So I was in Sapporo, the city of Sapporo. And it's like uh, if you have seen Game of Thrones, uh, we are always <laughs> scared that winter is coming. Not scared, actually, but we love the winters over there. You can see how beautiful it is, right? And this is a picture that I took uh, from in front of my uh, office building. So this was the Faculty of Environmental Earth Science that you see on the right over here. So it was a beautiful time over there. And it was not just... Uh, the the winter or the or the seasons over there it was the people also and the structure the very well organized structure in not only not only in your office but also in your life that that brings with the japanese lifestyle and also i love the food over there it was wonderful over there so this was kind of uh my phd time i had a wonderful uh, supervisor over there so Japanese supervisors are said to be very strict. Maybe Felix might know and some, some others might know because they are very strict about each and everything. So uh, if you miss a full stop in a sentence, they will, uh, they will really grind you for that. So that this kind of, uh, you know, attention to details. So the details, attention to the details was one of the things that attracted me about Japan. So generally they are unique, but this attention to detail. So if you have watched Japanese anime, Japanese anime is the animation movies from Japan, like uh, 
there used to, uh, some of you might have watched Doraemon and all, or your friends might have watched Doraemon. That's a very old cartoons from Japan, but there are animation movies like Totoro and uh, uh, Spirited Away. If you can search online, they are wonderful. They were made by, made, made by the Ghibli studio by Hayao Miyazaki uh, some 30, 40 years back. But even still, if you, you can see the attention to details in these movies. So that also helped me integrate this attention to details in my figures and in my work in my, during my PhD. And then from PhD after PhD, I got married. I, I came uh, back to India for a brief time. And then uh, I got uh, married to my partner. Uh, her name is Jubi, Jubi Elias Cole. Uh, we have been married for the last uh, 13, 14 years. So being in Japan, we were we had a long distance relationship, and then we uh, when I came back from Japan to India, uh, I uh, met her again, and uh, we got married, and then we moved to Italy, uh, where they had there was a climate change center. There is a climate change center in uh, uh, center for, uh, Euro Mediterranean Center for Climate Change in Bologna. So Bologna is like the food capital of Italy. Uh, when you talk about Italy, you might think about uh, pasta and uh, all that and chao they say chao right chao is for uh, hello and also bye so that is something you can learn uh, from this uh, discussion so if you if you meet a friend in italy you can say chao and when you go also you can say chao so easy easy italian for you so they offered me uh, uh, work at bologna as a research uh, associate so i did some climate modeling and over there for uh, uh, studying on links between Euro Mediterranean climate and the monsoon. So that was an interesting time. We also went around Europe. So this may not look like Europe much, but it looks, it might have been somewhere over there. It was a good time. So we had a good time uh, going around Europe as well. And then we had kids. So that's my son, Pratya. He's, uh, uh, name is actually Pratihara. It's a Sanskrit name which means return to inner self or it's, it's like a balance between the materialistic world and spiritual world. So uh, uh, essentially comes comes from Pradi and Ahara, two words in Sanskrit. And uh, this is my daughter uh, Parjanya uh, or we call her Paru. Paru uh, so Parjanya means monsoon rains in Sanskrit or rain clouds. So uh, this essentially connects with the work I'm doing as well, right? So Pratya and Paru, and uh, they're our friends and uh, we have been going around as well. So we had a sabbatical in the US also. So there was a lot of traveling in our life, which, uh, you know, broadened our, uh, uh, our perspectives about life, career and everything. So this was in, uh, we lived some time in Seattle we were in sleep, 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 sleepless in Seattle, I, I, we can say. You can see that uh, we are making all these shapes and faces uh, on a grass, uh, dry grassland in Seattle. So that is me, uh, Paru, Pratya, and uh, Jubi over there. Jubi is also called Sara. I forgot to tell you, she, she is now an artist and an author. She was an MBA graduate, but she is an author of uh, hand embroidery tutorials. She, she has several books, some seven books in Amazon and on her own website as well. So we moved around US for a while, and then we came back to Pune where I'm right now. So we uh, always wanted to come back live in some countries like US, Japan, and Italy and all were comfortable. It was fun. But, you know, inside there was this feeling and responsibility to work for India and also that feeling that you are a part of India, you know, uh, and uh, th that brought us back to India. <clears throat> so you can see me now uh, sitting in the sitting in the office. I have some mango trees outside. You can see <clears throat> it's a, so this is not a typical government office for you, right? But this is a, in fact a central government office. So you might have, you might be still remembering government offices as those bureaucratic offices where piles of papers are, are there and <clears throat> not so charismatic. But this is the government office for you, for me. And uh, life has changed since I have been here for the last 
13 years. So for 13 years, I have been working on climate change and monsoon and cyclones and all from, from this place. Right. So <coughs> that is about uh, my, uh, you know, personal journey in life uh, through, through photos and uh, my, uh, my family. Okay, very interesting, Roxy. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, I would say I'm jealous of seeing your office. So beautiful, man. You did a great job on, you know, it's a fresh sunlight coming inside an, uh, an office space. That actually, that shows that how how lively that uh, office space is, isn't it? It's really beautiful. And I think that when you said that you were in uh, Bologna, uh, University of Bologna, I guess it is the oldest university, the oldest in the world. Am I right? I think it's 1088 or something. Much exactly. older than any other university in the whole world, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was the oldest university in the world. I think. Uh, yeah, and it's it's wonderful over there. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, fantastic. I would like to ask you some questions about like, uh, you know, who were your inspirations when you were young? Is there any mentors uh, or, or do you have any favorite books that, uh, you know, tremendously influenced you uh, to mold your career? Yeah. Well, to answer that, I had many favorite books. <laughs> I, have, I have put some of them here. I think some of, some of them will feature in your list of books also Felix or, or some others and my inspirations were may, many of these authors others who wrote about uh, you know life in and around us uh, maybe outside this uh, outside earth or inside uh, in the earth so uh, I will talk very briefly about these books and uh, how it influenced me so the first book uh, that influenced me is by Gerald Dural I don't know if many of you have even heard about it. He has a much more famous brother called Lawrence Durrell, who also had written some fantastic books. I think I forgot there was a book. Uh, it was more. Uh, it it was actually banned during that time. I think because it was supposed to be uh, adult-oriented book, but uh, not anymore. So by Lawrence Durrell, you can you guys if you are interested, you can check that up. But Gerald Durrell. He used to write about, uh, you know, wild animals. He was he was wild by himself. And that's why you, you have this name, my family and other animals. Uh, so this was this particular book. He wrote several books. Uh, and this particular book talks about uh, when he was in a small, uh, when he went with his parents, like, like I went to Nigeria, he went to his parents went, uh, to a small island in Greece called Corfu. And uh, he met up with, so he used to go out and met up with a lot of animals, uh, wild animals. And some of them were orphaned. He used to bring them back home and he used to feed them and take care of them. And it was, it is, it's not just about the wildlife. It was funny. Every, every page or the next page, we will laugh on how, because he had a big family. And on top of that, his house, his room was full with some animals or birds. So, they used to create some ruckus in that house and uh, it was fun. And I used to, you know, I, I wanted to be just like him. So I used to go out, spend time with nature and observe. So one of the key skills that I got from this, unknowingly maybe, is the skill of observation. So observation is a skill, if, whether you are going into, into science or art or anything at all in your life, or even if you want to move uh, move ahead, uh, whether you are a computer specialist or whatever it is, observation is a skill that you might want in your life. So that is one skill that I got from Gerald Goodall. So later, when I when I grew up, uh, I think in high school or something, I tried to write write a letter to him, but uh, and I got a letter back, and when I opened it, it was from his wife. He, uh, she said uh, he had passed away. So the, uh, but there is a wildlife trust in his name, and uh, which is carrying on his legacy so you can search upon that book so this was one big influence and everybody knows Stephen Hawking he was a huge influence on me on bringing my interest into ast astronomy astrophysics and science uh, I don't have to t talk much about him but uh, I, uh, and his book it was it was again opening that imagination into space you know, there's one thing in his book that was, he, he starts talking about saying that he didn't want any equations. 
in his book. The only equation was e equal to mc squared. Still, he talks so interestingly about science, even to specialists. And that was that is something, you know, when we uh, when when we scientists are getting so so much into complex science, whether it is climate science or biotechnology or whatever, we need to learn about communicating science in very simple terms. And that's what Stephen Hawking did here. And uh, I should before getting into this book, I should tell this was Bill Bryson's book. It was it is one of the recent books which have influenced me recently. The, all the other books influenced me when I grew up. This is like a comprehensive book of lot many things which uh, is a must a must read. I will say he has written many other books also. Uh, I am not talking much about it. You should search in Amazon or somewhere else. So then we come to this book, Search in Secret India, and that's a book written by actually a foreigner by, called Paul Brandon. And this is a path I took somewhere, you know, in between uh, life when I was in college in undergrads and later when I uh, was doing my uh, postgraduate in my master's in Cochin University. So it took, talks about that philosophical, uh, you know, when we grow up, you, you have that question on who am I, what am I doing in this world? whether there is this uh, philosophical, spiritual side uh, that you have to explore. Is it, is it about science and all? So I really, I really went out there. Uh, so you can see there is a subtitle, classic work on seeking a guru. So he talks about seeking, I mean, going to many ashrams, uh, going through philosophical questions and all, and actually reaching back to oneself on uh, asking who am I and finding uh, the answers to the questions uh, from from uh, our own. So that is a path I took. I actually uh, took up uh, a, a trip to North India. You know, I was born in South India and have never had never visited North India at that time. So I went around. I I wore a symbol dhoti and I uh, traveled on uh, you know trains and buses and walking through. Uh, Rishikesh and all those philosophical gateways of India, uh, you know, talking to people uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, going to places, beautiful places uh, like Valley of Flowers and all in India. So this was a life that has changed. So it was not just traveling outside India, traveling inside uh, India and inside our own self. So. These are the inspirations that I had, uh, Felix, uh, and, uh, and the audience. This was wonderful. You should check up some of these books, I will say. Yes, sir. Your collection of books is so nice, and I'm so impressed to read them. So as we all know, uh, it's our decisions that make us different from others, right? So what was your inspiration to choose a career in basic science and do you think it's worth it's worth enough well uh, uh, well I, I think this question of uh, who we are and all had uh, was was a strong question inside me that made me start started asking questions about each and everything so that that I think brings us to a scientific mind and coring mind that's that's all about science so you don't need to be a scientist to uh, to ask scientific questions or pursue science even without becoming a uh, you know central uh, government officer or uh, uh, in the academics you can you can pursue science right in uh, everyday life so i think that's what led me so somehow uh, when i was doing my uh, class 12th uh, or junior college so that is the time when when we have to spread out our wings and uh, uh, you know narrow down our interest to a particular science. So what used to happen that time was many students either go go for uh, engineering or medical science, and this is a, this is a trend that is still uh, you know outlived the test of time. Even now, people are in that rat race, that very limited rat race of. Uh, uh, there are several coachings for uh, engineering, uh, very streamlined engineering or medical. But we have a plethora of uh, options in life, uh, and we have a plethora of skills that we we need to uh, 
take up on there are a lot of options in this world uh, uh, it can be uh, it can be on a on an artistic nature it can be on a skill wise nature it can be on a scientific nature there are so many things uh, like even the earth science field that i took up on so uh, talking about that uh, 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 this inquisitive mind might have been one reason that i took up uh, physical sciences, uh, particularly physics for my undergraduate, my, for my B.Sc. physics in uh, uh, CMS College in Kerala. And then, uh, so I told you with Stephen Hawking, I was very much inspired by uh, astrophysics. But at that time, uh, I was not that much uh, infatuated by the facilities in India for pursuing astrophysics. And the next thing, that I saw was uh, air sciences, particularly ocean sciences. So ocean sciences gave me an opportunity. You know, I was interested in nature, and at the same time, I was interested in physics and science. So ocean science gave me an opportunity to bring them all together. So it's 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 natural science, right? Natural physical science. So that is where I reached upon, and uh, today I am uh, I am working on. Uh, not only physics, I am I am with air science because nature is so interdisciplinary. It is transdisciplinary. It's cross cross disciplines. Like even even the health you are talking about, we are in COVID times. We are still to find a link with uh, climate and climate change. But it is said that some of the climate factors, like uh, moisture available in the atmosphere or the heat could have a potential impact on the number of COVID cases, but we will only know once it is come down from an epidemic to a localized uh, uh, disease. So there's a huge scope uh, uh, in air sciences that uh, we could pursue, and that's where I reached. And uh, talking about that, uh, I would like to give this example. So for all the audience and also uh, for Felix and uh, the host, uh, I want, I I want all of you guys to take a deep breath. It's not a spiritual exercise. Uh, just, a, just a deep breath along with me. Have you taken? I want to hear from you. Yes. Perfect. So you know what? Uh, we, we talk about uh, oxygen from trees and all, right? But it, it is not that. The, the, 50% of the air, 50% of the oxygen that you breathe, from, uh, you breathe in from, that came from phytoplankton in the ocean. Phytoplankton are micro, micro, micro organic, uh, uh, microscopic plants in the ocean, uh, right? So they're like plants. Uh, we, we won't see such kind of, uh, we, you can call it algae. Uh, uh, some, some of it is called algae. And uh, these microscopic plants, millions of years, ago generated the oxygen that you're breathing in yeah what a, a nice experiment right so when you take each breath you have to thank the oceans right and so is the water also so whenever you have monsoon rains over over land or uh, anywhere uh, you know over land it mostly comes from the oceans right so we have to thank the oceans for both the air and the water also so that means there is a huge scope uh, in uh, physical sciences, air sciences, and that's where, where I reached. And I'm happy about it. You know about the cyclone that is uh, fuel uh, in the Arabian Sea. Those are because of the warm waters in the Arabian Sea, right? And uh, I'm studying about them. And uh, in fact, uh, just before this uh, talk and after this talk, I, I am in discussion with other people on how these cyclones are developing in the Arabian Sea. So that is another topic to talk about so but that is that is how i reached into uh, physical sciences into earth sciences yeah yes roxy very interesting journey and yeah it's uh, i think yeah, it's really really important to see uh, the contribution of phytoplankton and algae though we completely forget isn't it so in june 5th for example environment day we plant the tree of course the trees are really important but uh, you know, the, the phytoplankton and the, the even the mere existence of ocean, we take it for granted. Exactly. So, yeah, so I was just wondering, uh, Roxy, because you are now part of IPCC, it's one of the most prestigious organization, the most, I would say, you know, and also in the UN, uh, you know, the Indian Ocean uh, panel. How did you get in and how did you make it uh, in such a big 
committee like IPCC. Over to you. Well, thanks, Felix. Uh, I think uh, it was a great moment for me to get into IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change. It's a body of uh, experts from not only from science, but also uh, social sciences, from economics, from uh, uh, and also sometimes occasionally policy, uh, policy driven uh, scientists also. So, uh, so what happens is that this body uh, comes together uh, every few months or years and work on uh, the status and fate of the globe on how the climate is changing and. Uh, uh, you know the best practices different nations can take uh, on uh, how on how to deal with the with the climate change, and that's uh, that's where so you can see this this photo is from uh, uh, one of the lead other meeting. I was a lead author of uh, uh, one or two reports of IPCC. So this is from a special report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate. This is in Russia. It was a cold time. It was uh, again winter. And uh, you can see everyone wearing very uh, thick clothes. I have a thick skin, so you don't see very <laughs> thick clothes. <laughs> Just joking. So IPCC, uh, so uh, I told you about coming back to India, right? So I think that also had, I mean, something to uh, connect with uh, why I am in IPCC now. So suppose I was in uh, Japan or Italy or in the US uh, working with some other agencies, uh, I may not have got that chance to work in IPCC. So coming back to India gave me more responsibility. It gave me a chance to work on uh, the factors that is uh, that the country is uh, dealing with, like, uh, like it's monsoon, like it's uh, cyclones and all. So uh, that helped me to become a regional expert, right? And that was one of the reasons why I got uh, 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 inducted to IPCC, but also I have to say there is uh, uh, in uh, in many panels and all there is always uh, uh, politics playing, and it is it is not in panels, but it could be from the nomination side as well. So I should say uh, so because this is a candid discussion. I should say that I was not nominated by my institution actually. I was nominated by uh, international organization because uh, because they found I was working on Indian Ocean and Indian Monsoon. They uh, they nominated me for for the work I am doing. So in fact, IPCC takes care of that because uh, so that is one thing I want, want want to tell you. Many of the people that you see here are women, right? So it is difficult to see because many of them are wearing caps and all, but many are women. And there are many people from different parts of uh, uh, parts of the world. So it's not people from Western countries or Eastern countries or from the uh, from uh, uh, African countries. It's from all over the world, from dif with different ages, early career scientists or senior scientists, experts, and uh, also from different branches. So there is a huge diversity. This this was a learning process for me. Yeah, and uh, so. Uh, which is why I think another reason why I got into IPCC. So when so this is this diversity is one thing that uh, we need to uh, bother about whether it is our uh, workplace or uh, in our life or uh, whether our friends because it can it's uh, it's like it, it, it's like an easy way to travel to different countries and to different minds and learn you learn different approaches to life to to each and every problem uh, when you open up your mind to diverse kind of people so that was my experience with uh, ipcc uh, uh, i should say yeah yes sir so the next thing is uh, you should have got a role model right so we acquire we have always wanted to acquire some qualities from some of the science leaders and all and according to you, what is the best thing a science, a best quality a science leader should have? Well, <laughs> uh, well, that's a tricky question. Uh, and uh, I should say there are, uh, well, very often we come up to qualities like hardworking and uh, 
you know, working, you know, in India, there is this quote called working for 14 hours a day or more. Well, I don't subscribe to that. Well, that is good for some. It works for some. Anyway, let us look into some other aspects which generally don't come to us, right? So here I put uh, five points which came immediately to my mind. Those are the first thing I already talked about. Encourage diversity. Leadership should always encourage diversity. There should be regional diversity, gender diversity, age particularly. We might think, okay, we should uh, uh, only encourage seniors or uh, encourage youngsters. No, nothing like that. We should encourage. Uh, so I remember a few years back, a person who had retired from the army was interested in climate change on on what is happening how how climate change is affecting the himalayas and uh, those places where the army is working and uh, he came to me and i was ready to work with him so we need to be open up to different uh, diverse ideas and people right and particularly the most important i would say is encourage women why why women particularly because if you look we have very few women leaders and the change they can bring into uh, whether it is a scientific world, a political world, or anywhere else. If you look around the globe, you can see women are very perfectly, I mean, it should be skilled women, right? And uh, this, the way they carry out uh, and approach risks and uh, do things in a timely manner, their, their priorities are different. They are, uh, the way they approach a problem is quite different so we need to encourage we need we need to have that balance in having more women uh, in our groups and as scientific leaders also so that is one thing and another thing is we need to utilize the skills and enthusiasm of youngsters at the same time expertise and wisdom of seniors so many times so the problem is when we grow up we I mean, like in college and school we stick with one age group right so that is part of our, our growing up but we have to put a mindful, uh, uh, we need to try to work along with different age groups because youngsters come with new skills. The skill I learned when I was a graduate or uh, during my PhD is not the skill that people use nowadays. Like my students are working on artificial intelligence. They're working on Python. They're coding, they're fantastic coders in Python and I should be ready to listen to them and interact with them so that I can learn from them. And they also have the enthusiasm to come up with new problems. Otherwise, I will be stuck with some age old theories. But at the same time, you know, the seniors have a knack of uh, how to that. They have the patience and the knack of uh, how to uh, use their expertise uh, and also how to present and uh, perfect these ideas that youngsters have. So we should be able to work. A leader should be able to work. work up all these together this is this is applicable for covid also if you look at uh, uh, how the data is used is the youngsters there that, that are churning out the data and the graphs uh, so that we know how the how the covid scenario is moving and where the attention should be and most of all this is a this is a tricky place but there are uh, uh, places when we need to converse with policy makers and also advise them so uh like uh, like in my case climate change i can i can sit with saying that climate climate is changing but if i don't bring it across to the policy makers or how it is changing and what we can do about it uh, we won't we won't progress the country won't progress and a leader should be broad minded so all these things are about broad mindedness and it's not that so i told about earth sciences is transdisciplinary if you take any science even computer science I heard uh, recently that IIT people, they are asking their engineers to go to medical uh, colleges and learn from them and medical officers to go to uh, these engineering colleges and learn from them. It is to broaden your sphere. And on top of that, we need to, I mean, we, we shouldn't sit in this position as a leader all the time, but also we should mentor new leaders and also give way to youngsters. I had many, you know, uh, uh, times when uh, program managers and people like that uh, sit in positions for decades, they grow stale, they don't have any ideas and they don't give space to youngsters. So that is a scenario we need to avoid. And this is a cartoon which shows uh, how, you know, how a policymaker uh, 
uh, this is in Hyderabad, he says, uh, why do we need uh, conservation of rivers and green spaces and all, and then they have floods suddenly. And so this is how you can, in many ways, you know, converse and show that extreme events are happening due to climate change to policy makers and make them understand. Uh, I, I'm a huge fo follower of cartoons. This is a uh, cartoonist co uh, who, uh, whose uh, column is called Green Humor. Rohan is his name. You should follow him as well. Yeah, so that is about about what a key leadership should be. Yeah. Yeah, yes, Roxy is very interesting. And I'm really happy to note that, you know, in the our academy, the Young Academy, were, which is part of this program, we are also following rigorously this gender uh, equality, you know, Perfect. inclusivity, for example. Uh, because we the, the entire story we started from the young science leader, uh, you know, uh, there is basically the science leader workshop which we had, and uh, we made sure that, uh, you know, half of the speakers are women and half are men. And here also, all this young science leader series, we have one moderator male, one is. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. yeah. So I that is that one thing I want to tell you. Yeah, I think that's important because I see. Uh, even now, many panels are fully male. We should avoid that. Exactly, exactly. And also the youngsters, you, you rightly uh, pointed out that uh, way back in, I think, uh, post-independence, I'm not sure, or early pre-independence days, uh, when Bark was established, B-A-R-C, in Bombay, Trombay, uh, yeah. the Nehru, I think, he handpicked the Homi Baba, and he was only in 30s to lead that big organization to, to, to be a, become the founder, director of BAR. So that uh, mentality somehow it's missing nowadays, isn't it? And also the mentorship you rightly pointed out. And uh, in, in this academy, our one of our key program is called Mentex, uh, wow. which is idea matchmaking between mentor and mentees, completely free, virtual, and uh, really lots of people are getting benefited out of it. I hope you will also contribute into our program. Sure. And now, you have very interesting lab in uh, uh, IITM. So, you know, you have been do, uh, working there for quite some time. And do you have any, any tips on lab management? For example, typically, I want to ask you specifically, I would like to know, like, um, if, if at all there is some conflict uh, happening in your lab, for example, shared space or shared equipment or authorship in, in, the, in the paper. So what are your strategies to resolve those kind of conflict, conflict resolution? And also because you lived in so many parts of the world, uh, what are your tips on intercultural and cross-cultural communication? Yeah, well, thanks for that, Felix. That's, uh, I would like to introduce my lab here. So this is a uh, maybe two or three year old photo and uh, we call it a climate research lab. It's, it's actually mostly uh, PhD students and also master's thesis students. It's uh, because we are not in academia, it's difficult for us to get PhD students, but many times there are many uh, master's students also coming in for their internship. So uh, I work closely with them. They have very short time, but I love uh, working with them as well, because actually some of my interesting work der were derived out of master's thesis. So, never underestimate the six uh, six month or three month master's thesis you are doing you can bring out excellent uh, solutions to excellent problems so one of the important things that we have in our group is we have frequent meetings now that is something i learned from japan as well and try to replicate here and that has worked exceptionally well for me so we every Thursday we have a meeting. Uh, I mean, these days it, it can be intermittent depending on uh, how it is, uh, how how each member it is. Now it is more online. But uh, uh, this is a comic from PhD Comics. You should follow PhD Comics. There are a lot of PhD Comics uh, out there. It's funny. So we keep it casual. We uh, but at the same time uh, strict as well uh, to certain ideals. So. Weekly import meetings are quite important for us. It's a time when where they bring up not only their science, but also their issues, their issues with their work or, or also their career, uh, future career or their life as well. So this is where we solve our uh, you know, issues, the conflicts that you were talking about, Felix. And uh, so one of the thing is uh, that we, uh, we try to keep everything a bit open-minded so uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, you know other than uh, lab meetings we also go for 
these outings once in a while. So it happens. Uh, so once in a while we go to restaurants. We used to before pre-COVID times, and we also used to ca camp outside. This was uh, when we camped uh, nearby a lake in the open sky, watching watching stars and all uh, with the students at that time. And uh, it, it's all fun it, it, building that rapport here with uh, uh, rapport with uh, students is fun. So that helps in. Uh, you know, avoiding conflicts also. And I, I keep an open mentality. So the, the problem in many research groups is that uh, uh, there, there is a shyness in approaching other research groups, other faculty, other students on the work they are doing. So here I tell that I'm not a guru of each and everything. I, uh, I, have, I have some knowledge, some expertise in dealing with science, and uh, but I don't know everything, right? And it's the same for you or anyone, any scientist, whether you take Einstein or uh, um, if you if you remember uh, Sherlock Holmes, right? He's not a scientist, of course, but he 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 was narrowly focused, right? He was narrowly focused in uh, in his detective terms. So similarly, I give my students an opportunity to collaborate with other scientists in the same institution or other institutions in India or outside India also. So they write emails to them or they go and meet those, uh, uh, meet those uh, researches and also get ideas from there to you know, help their study. So, so these students are not with single mentor. So I, I, I'm just to guide, give an overall guidance to them. So that, is, that helps in uh, bringing out, uh, you know, alleviating a lot of conflicts, you know. So that is one thing. And uh, I also help them with life skills. So whenever I'm not in office or going for vacation or travel, I ask them to water my plants. They do that very nicely. Sometimes uh, more than one people water my plants and they, the plants die. <laughs> Those things happen. This is a beautiful plant uh, in my office. Uh, it, it has a kind of photo, uh, photo reaction. So when there is sunlight, it is uh, up. When there is, uh, when there is no sunlight, it droops down. Uh, photolysis or something is called. So nowadays we are meeting online, and uh, uh, it has been a week or more since we met last time. We are more conversing through email these days because of a lot many things uh, going around. So this is my lab, and it is a wonderful lab, and uh, that's how I deal with them. And in my website, uh, I, we have the Climate Research Lab website. We, I have put uh, this, uh, you know, uh, some guidelines. You should read through them. So some of them will be applicable to many students over here also on how to deal with uh, uh, several situations in your in your life and uh, lab life. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting, uh, Roxy. So you said like, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this uh, cross-cultural communication. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, you know, this particular thing that you you highlighted is, uh, I also, in my experience too, you know, music and food uh, can really bring, you know, that can actually, uh, you know, intuitively can communicate between the groups, isn't it? And also travel, you have actually traveled quite extensively in various countries. And one of the quote is from Mark Twain. It says, uh, "The travel is uh, the best cure for racism." <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> true that. True that. Yeah. Yeah. Over to you, Nomika. Do you have any question? Yes, sir. I think you have got a passion for photography, and the pictures you have put up are awesome. To be frank, and huh. uh, do you have any ideas to foster creativity in the youngsters? Yeah, now Mika. So uh, yeah, I have this passion for uh, photography. In fact, I, I should say maybe I had. I still have that passion, but you know, lot many things are cropping in that it's it's quite difficult. But I should say that I was I was uh, in fact happy with myself uh, when I was able to take this photograph. This is actually a photograph from uh, behind my quarters. Okay, this is a bio weaver bird making its nest. It's actually stitching its nest. You can see the thread of the uh, thin grass. This grass also is from behind my, uh, behind the quarters where I'm staying. I'm staying in the canvas itself. And uh, so, so and uh, I'm happy to say that this photo was uh, uh, taken up by National Geographic, not for their magazine, but one of their publications for, you know, students and kids. 
so they are coming up soon and uh, you know if you're lucky and if you pursue a passion you can even make money out of that dollars out of that right i'm not saying how many dollars but uh, something like 500 dollars yeah so anyway so this uh, uh, you know the about any passion that you pursue uh, i think it's good to have specifics about it for, particularly if you are in photo, photography i was interested originally interested in macro photography photographing for uh, make taking photos of very tiny insects and uh, uh, even tiny birds and all like that and explore their world and it was not only that i used to think about the subject so that is one thing you know uh, many photographers forget about so uh, now we all have these gadgets cameras and all and we just click 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 we can take multiple clicks and then forget about it right and see just the composition is okay if the photo is okay but what i would suggest if you are pursuing photography or a passion like that is to study the subject intensively so i used to go there and watch them patiently so patience is another thing studying the subject is another thing so that is how i pursued my you know passion in photography so that helped me to learn what time uh, uh, they build their nest how they build their nest actually this tree that you see are thorny trees so just to avoid snakes and other animals coming up their uh, nest so they build their nest at the very edge of a tall thorny tree right and that's how they the, they make their nest uh, uh, you know uh, safe from those animals but at the same time there are huge monsoon winds and all happening so they try to stitch these nests very thickly to a you know very uh, strong solid branch of the nest and only if everything is perfect this is a male by a weaver bird that is building its nest right and only if everything is perfect if the location is perfect if the uh, uh, the branch is stable and if the nest is beautiful and long this has to be very long at the end then only the female by a weaver bird will take up the nest so that is so that is the detail of the subject that i'm talking about so if if you pursue in that detail you can excel in photography it is not the gadget i would say so that is about the uh, about passion and uh, photography that i would that mess, the message that i have right now yeah fantastic roxy so it's so beautiful this picture is amazing really you know the details you said the passion of the details you picked up from japan and the japanese uh, you know it's the intricate detail is so clear yeah. so crisp and it's more not just uh, some random pick the the image actually shows uh, you know it's like a story you see uh, just by looking at that photo i can see that lots of things are coming to my mind i think that is how to judge a good photo from a mediocre one it should show some kind of a kind of a, you know abstraction some message isn't it what kind of equipment do you use sir roxy so this was uh, for this one i used a nikon 5300 with uh, uh, 150 mm macro lens uh, or a kind of a telephoto lens that's why what i use because it was a bit high up in the uh on the tree so that's what i used here but i i, I remember that uh, long back when i was uh, in school and college i used to carry very very simple uh, cameras at that time and still had uh, good photographs uh, from that time also so it's uh, i won't worry too much it depends well if you can afford of course it's okay but otherwise anything can work yeah great uh, i can also see that you have a fantastic website i never actually even thought of having my own website so you know you you are an inspiration for me roxy.org right r o c k uh, rock then c s e a uh, yeah. dot .org is it the same website that you have yeah that's a website that's the main domain we yeah, i remember that i actually saw many of your pics long time back and yeah, I mean, could you please give some tips on uh, emerging, uh, you know, the, the scientists and PhD students who are watching this show on uh, making a website and, you know, how, how did it actually help you uh, on your career or, or to portray your creative works? Yeah, so making photos uh, document your work, right? 
like in photography. So like that, uh, when you are doing science, uh, making figures or making a chemical composition or something that documents your work, and then you write in a paper that documents your work. So similarly, uh, it's always helpful to document your life and that life with uh, these photos, your work, everything. So that's what I did with my website, and that that you know that helps. Uh, human memory is short as well, so that, that uh, remains tells me how the, the 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 path that I took. Uh, I think I started my website maybe when Yahoo had this GeoCities way back in 2000. So it is more than 20 years since I had these websites. Uh, I think Felix also had a website like that at that time. So I. Uh, so I have been using HTML early on and then moved into PHP. Right now I'm using WordPress and all, but the so WordPress is very easy, easy to use. And these, these days uh, hosting and domain is not that expensive. You can find a consistent hosting and uh, domain. And then, or you can, uh, you know, there are many free domains uh, and uh, hosting services that, that are available, but then, uh, you know, you lose that individuality and you, you lose that control uh, over those websites, which is why I had my own domain early on. That's, that has helped me a lot. So over time, it's not like, like you know, in one day you put all in there, all your work in there, but uh, uh, over time, you know, you, you improve yourself, your own work. And uh, I, I used to write, uh, write a lot of blogs. We used to have blog communities like some 10, 15 years back, I used to write in Malayalam also at that time, one of the earliest uh, Malayalam blog writers, I should say. Uh, it's not that I am fantastic in writing, but one of the earliest, that's all. So uh, even now, you know, students can uh, put their uh, life journey, their work journey on their, or their code or, uh, you know, uh, whatever, you don't have to, put in uh, a lot of effort to build a website. So uh, you can start small and that's how we learn. Just, you know, you saw that first photo, first wallpaper where that boy is sleeping with the lamp to the darkness. You take that risk, uh, informed risk, right? You do a little bit of research and start your own uh, website or your own writing, you will excel in it. And that will help in, help in your life as well. And also to showcase your work later, yeah? Yeah, coming to the contents, the showcasing your work and uh, writing the and releasing the original content. Roxy, you you're doing a fantastic job on popularization of the science. Uh, for example, KSSP, and you have written uh, an article uh, that is how I also started to write a lot on uh, uh, Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad Shastra Kerala, for example. You know, so you do a lot of science outreach, uh, popularization, and also it's very important because uh, right now the fake news is uh, traveling uh, the other side of the, <laughs> the planet Earth in fraction of second. Uh, you yeah. know, when, uh, the the real real news, the truth is taking only very very like snail space. It goes while fake news is everywhere. So you know that the pseudoscience and fake news is spreading everywhere and it's alarming, uh, you know, and especially during the COVID-19 time, uh, this is the pseudoscience is actually uh, wrecking havoc, I would say. And many people are losing their uh, life uh, because of that. So uh, what is your opinion for like uh, to, to foster uh, and promote the scientific temper in today's youth? Well, uh, I think it's, uh, we are, uh, I mean, uh, going through challenging times. We have such a kind of scientific advancement. At the same time, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, fake news and uh, everything is getting mixed up uh, out there. So I think we need to really work upon that. And maybe one, one way to work upon that is to, uh, you know, to, it's not just enough to teach at school uh, on math, physics, science, math, uh, and uh, uh, subjects and languages and all, but also to, you know, find the, uh, 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 make the understanding oneself, how to, uh, if you want to learn science or if you want to learn something, how to look it for yourself and find it, uh, how to authenticate uh, the science that you're learning. So it's not, it should not be confined to learning from textbooks alone, but also about the learning process itself. So if you are able to do that, uh, when we are in school itself, I think that can make a huge change, right? I, I, I think that's, that, is, that is something uh, which can 
improve the scientific temper uh, of of our nation or, or of the globe so we have to improve on our learning process uh, and uh, i think that itself can help so then we will always you know when something comes comes to us some news comes to us through whatsapp or facebook we will cross check it at least once with and authenticate it we have google in our hand it's quite easy to authenticate and but in that process we will learn which which are the dependable sources connected to uh, reference material so that is how probably we can build scientific temper and also nowadays uh, media is very much interested in bringing up science but at the same time there is uh, you know um, fox media also is there so i don't know we need to work upon that yeah Uh, yes, Mamika, do you have any question? Yes, I have, I have one more. So what's the key thing or the key information or what skills you have to say to the young scientists of the country? Yeah, so many to talk about that. Uh, and uh, I would, I would give some simple uh, messages. Uh, you know, when you are getting into science as a researcher or a scientist or a professor, it's like uh, this picture you have to multitask with a lot of things and uh, uh, if you end up like me you will have uh, kids family as well uh, you will have parents you will have kids you will have uh, 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 social uh, communication along with the science you are doing the science also you will have different kind of students and colleagues and all and different kind of problems to deal with so we will we will have to acquire skills for all of that so that is the that is the thing it's not just about doing so when you are a researcher <clears throat> doing phd or something you might be very narrowly focused but when you are becoming a scientist you have to know how to present it you have to know how to communicate it you have to know its political Im implications so many things so some of the messages that i want to tell is sharpen your analysis and writing skills early on so in school or college itself you need to work on your reading writing and skills and all observational skills and when you are doing your phd your analysis skills so because whatever you learn during that time will stick with you for a long time later in your career so don't think that when you are a scientist you will learn something new you are mostly using your earlier skills when you are young of course if you are open-minded you will learn more but that is very hard to get, right? And keep your activities and reading broad. Keep reading. Work on both individual and team skills. Sometimes you need individual skills. Sometimes you need team skills. That comes to these team skills will help also help. If you have uh, group meetings in your, uh, uh, in your lab group, you will develop both social and communication skills also because we are giving students an opportunity. So try to communicate your work with your peers, your friends, and also, if possible, in your uh, Facebook or WhatsApp also, right? That will help your communication skills. And one, one thing which many people talk, don't talk about is aesthetics. Aesthetics is quite important in communication because whatever you communicate, if it is not presented in a nice way, right? With nice figures or graphics and uh, illustration, others will don't share it they will not see it they will not go through it so keep the aesthetics good and take care of your health this is one thing many of us forget and this is something i i try to do even now so if you run or uh, if you can do uh, and many many you know youngsters when when they are around that phd age around 20 25 years age that's when they get stuck to a chair and they think they're in the uh, they're in the top of their health, but that is wrong. That's a time when you actually should start exercising every day. Okay. So if, and I can tell you one thing for sure, if I have done some running today, some walking today, or some push-ups or some crunches today, my day is happy. I'm happy that day, right? Mark that. So this should stay through your life. Health is quite important if you're uh, getting into scientific research, especially if you are sitting 
sitting on your chair most of most of your time yeah i think this this that's a lot of messages here great roxy you may please exit yeah thank you i am exiting with this wallpaper over here fantastic i really enjoyed talking to you and uh, yeah all these messages are really take home messages and uh, you know all these pearls of wisdom i would say and yeah i really enjoyed talking to you roxy today and uh, yeah i mean while talking to you after such a long time uh, your accent and the way you speak i can see a lot of semblance with uh, sashi tarur i don't know did anyone tell you about that sashi tarur and you i mean i don't know the frequency or the voice is quite matching <laughs> i would say that's one fucking fantastic thank you yeah and uh, roxy yeah right now let us start this uh, final discussion with a little bit on the current affairs the climate change and right now you know there's uh, one week back uh, i mean one month back i was in kochi and i visited the chalanam beach and now the chalanam is uh, uh, you know it's it's a huge crisis there because of the you know the, the cyclone uh, happening over there and uh, the people over there chalanam says that the government didn't do and we are losing all the property is there any truth in it or is it because of the climate change ramifications of the climate change or is it a mix what is your take on it and uh, how you know how tough it says that the, the current cyclone is like the strongest in the last two decades in the in you know in the in the arabian sea do you agree with that statement over to you yeah so you know suddenly the arabian sea and the west coast is becoming quite active and that's one of the reasons is uh, global warming uh, and climate change uh, our increased emissions carbon emissions due from industries and uh, industrialization from workers or all, all human activities even the phone we hold uh, ultimately is uh, uh, some fossil fuel is burning somewhere right so all these have led to increased uh, uh, emissions and increased uh, warm temperatures so the, the the thing about atmosphere is that uh, or climate is that when there is more temperature more warm air it means it becomes much more unstable so it 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 uh, leads to a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, chaos chaos in the atmosphere and uh, uh, at the same time some organized uh, systems like this like cyclones and all so cyclones generally draw their energy from from the warm waters in the ocean for 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 us in the west coast it's from the arabian sea and arabian sea has been warming uh, in the last few decades the temperature change alone is more than 1 degree celsius which is like quite large compared to the global average which is like around 0.9 degree celsius so and for some areas it can be 1.2 1.3 degree celsius and this has led to you know intensification of cyclones so the frequency not only the frequency of cyclones but also the intensity of cyclones have increased in the arabian sea region and many uh, now we are seeing that they are coming very close to west coast that is that is something we are to be bothered about so uh, compared to bay of bengal arabian sea was calmer so i think that was one of the reason we were not generally prepared for you know uh, you know historically we were not prepared on on the west coast uh, for cyclones and all but we have been having back to back floods also uh yeah, like uh, that happened in kerala karnataka and all you know, over the western ghats last year and mumbai every year we are having floods so these things are happening again and again and we are i think we are an overall less prepared and another factor which is acting here is the compound effect so cyclones heavy rains and sea level rise are working together in inundating the uh, regions like chelanam that we saw so i think uh so i don't know exactly how prepared as a government was but we can say the forecasts are reaching now early on forecast cyclone forecasts are improved tremendously we got signs almost one week back about this cyclone and fishermen were said not to not to approach the sea and uh, people were asked to evacuate as well so some precautions were in place but still the impact was more than what we ex expected there were storm surges which in other places so we need to have a long term vision with the uh, data and models we can tell how it will change in the future so instead of waiting for each event and each forecast we should work on a long term framework now me cover to you you may please pick up one question from our chat box yes sir here is a question from the viewer it's from sindhu manoj uh, she she asked recently a part of a rocket fell into the indian ocean all these at the debris in the ocean are there any international norms to govern these 
uh, you are talking about plastic right rocket i think rocket ha so. huh, okay okay well uh, well i i won't see much big impact for a single rocket yeah and uh, it won't have as a single object it won't have much impact but a lot of things are falling in the ocean every day every moment so whatever we are having maybe things in my lab also will ultimately go into the into the ocean because ultimately we are throwing things out we don't have a waste proper waste management system uh, we can't think about space waste management system in the space uh, before uh, we are talking about waste management system in the land so uh, because we don't have a waste management system each and everything uh, in our office in our homes ultimately end up in rivers and they end up in oceans and and they are coming back to us as microplastics in fish and other other things in even even along with the algae that we eat so it's it's something terrible so rocket i won't be worried about but uh, plastics yeah uh, roxy yes exactly the microplastics and you know the pollution is everywhere in one sense you know like uh, one of my favorite author is voltaire and voltaire famously said common sense is not so common you know like uh, if if you see like uh, uh, you know this uh, what to say uh, any kind of vegetable you know for example cauliflower and cauliflower with lots of uh, worms you know you will you feel yucky about it right it's all about perspective isn't it so you try to destroy all these worms at the same time how about invisible chemical the pesticide you are okay with that <laughs> you see that is really tough isn't it this this kind of perspective change i was just thinking like uh, one of the uh, you know your uh, my interaction with you you shared in the facebook long long time back when you were in south africa i guess you went for a streaking i was so surprised that i mean did you go i'm not sure i that is what my my memory is you know streaking in the south africa i think one of the part of the, your ipcc <laughs> well i did not for streaking i shared a photo of somebody else streaking yes yeah, somebody else was streaking correct and uh, you see the earth you know if you if you revere the earth as a mother of course uh, mother earth is a, it's a fantastic metaphor and uh, you see that i would say that nudity is not that vulgar uh, but raping her is more vulgar do you agree with that statement uh, totally totally i don't i, I don't recently use uh, flowery language like mother earth and all and i think so that is an excuse for us to um, sometimes you know okay mother earth but people have to think this is my property this is my house so in india you can see uh, people taking care of their house and uh, Uh, premises around very neatly but they throw the garbage outside but if you think mother mother earth or earth as our own house uh, my own property then that is where i think change can happen very interesting over to nomika you can pick up the next question so i think we have three more minutes and then yes uh, uh, maybe last question anomika yes sir So, are there any undergraduate courses in climate studies and oceanography? Yeah, many, many. Actually, uh, there are courses in uh, many universities across the country, and IITs also. Uh, undergraduate courses, actually, in Cochin University, there are many courses are there. Uh, in Anna University in South Kolkata University, there are marine science uh, courses. Hyderabad University has. There are many universities with. Uh, uh courses on ocean sciences air sciences and all great uh, uh, last question uh, to you roxy is about uh, philosophy you know so objectivity versus neutrality so the, this particular thing that is actually coming into my mind again and again is that you know for the sake of maintaining neutrality in especially with the journalist they call the from the other side to to hear the other point of view for example holocaust you are calling holocaust denier with holocaust survivor is completely opposite you see uh, mm-hmm. it's like truth versus lie the middle ground just for the sake of uh, neutrality do you agree with this kind of neutrality or do you want to see go with objectivity especially because you are working with climate change there are so much of climate denialism outrightly they say that climate change is unreal and uh, do you uh, agree to include this climate denialism as part of the textbook for example darwin versus uh, you know the artificial intelligence i mean uh, cre- artificial design you know see so, intelligent design yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> in you know in many of these uh, uh, topics of discussion actually uh, it's high time i mean we have so much of data 
and uh, we can actually uh, tread our way uh, very objectively because uh, uh, in case of climate change uh, if you if you take climate change actually it's actually a distraction if you call uh, climate change denial people and uh, you know have discussion about uh, whether this climate is changing or not because it is high time that we move away from uh, you know even i am tired of proving every time okay the ocean is warming here things are extreme events are happening okay i want to move on to solutions i want to move on to action or show that okay it's moving by these numbers so that we can take precautions so i think uh, that kind of neutrality where you know where we try to balance uh, uh, the the discussion with somebody uh, something else with totally opposite and totally unscientific is uh, is a big distraction and it, it actually holds us back and actually many people might think uh, end up thinking okay they, he has got some point which may not be based on data so that is how you know that scientific chamber crashes yeah thanks a lot roxy for being part of our uh, discussion i really enjoyed uh, this talk and uh, you have enlightened you we have touched up so many of the topics isn't it photography and uh, you know philosophy uh, your own you know your own upbringing uh, all the way from uh, uh, nigeria isn't it you said uh, fantastic i really enjoyed it uh, roxy thanks a lot for this uh, you know uh, this evening so we had a great discussion i completely enjoyed it. thanks a lot felix i am i am actually in fact moving on to another discussion on Cyclone Tokte and uh, people are welcome. Uh, I, I don't have the link, but uh, might be in Facebook or something. So I had a wonderful discussion with you, Felix and uh, Young Academy and Omega, you, you too. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, keep it going. And hopefully I have sent some message across for you all. Uh, see you all again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Roxy. And also Naomika, thanks a lot. You did a fantastic work, Naomika. And thanks for all of you listeners and please stay tuned for the next week. We have Patmini from US uh, FDA. Uh, you know, she's working in US FDA and uh, one of the prestigious organizations. So uh, uh, come back uh, next Sunday at 4.30 p.m. Till then, goodbye from the team of uh, Young Academy.